Welcome to Deep Dive, MH370, episode 22, The Hacker. Hello again, everyone. I'm Andy Tarnoff, the publisher and founder of On Milwaukee, a daily magazine, city guide, and media company based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I am joined by our intrepid adventurer and journalist, bon vivant, Jeff Wise, who is also the author of The Taking of MH370 and happens to be in a well-known Netflix documentary as well. Welcome back, Jeff. How are you? I'm I'm doing okay, Andy. Actually, I'm I'm wearing my adventure shirt for you today, so so I Thank can you. fit up to that billing. But I'm very excited about today's episode because we're moving the ball in a major way with regards to the mystery of MH370. It's a game changer because we're going to be looking at an aspect of the case that has been highly controversial, uh, but it's really foundational for understanding what might have happened to the plane. So today we're going to hear from a respected professional and get his assessment. We're going to learn that something a lot of people have had a hard time getting their, wrapping their heads around um, and frankly have been resistant to maybe isn't such an outlandish idea after all. Uh, you know, I think it's been really cool lately, Andy, that we've been bringing in more expert voices. We started the whole podcast with with an outside um, voice, and we we kind of got away from that. We were just kind of bringing readers up through the basics. Yeah. And now that we're getting into the really kind of nitty gritty, I, I think it's been really useful to have um, to hear the opinions of really experts, like people who are leading academics in their field. On the one hand, as you sift through all this information and try to make sense of what could have happened to the plane, it's great to come up with ideas for what might have happened. That's step one. Step two is trying to assess, like, are these ideas, do they have any merit? Right. And to do that, you really have to go out into the world and find people who do this bread and butter for their living and can tell you, no, you're on the right track or no, you're not on the right track. We started doing this approach on the podcast where um, we talked last time about how I was reading the literature. I was talking to some people and I was coming up with some ideas uh, th that I was uh, sharing you know, in articles and on the podcast. And you said, well, is this you? Is this your opinion? Or do actually people who know what they're talking about think this? Yeah. And so I thought, OK, we need to bring in, in, in an article. You would quote somebody. Right? For sure. Um, so let's, 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 yeah, we got some quotes, <laughs> we got some quotes, we got, we got more quotes. than just some quotes. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to talk yeah. just a little bit about sort of the progress of this podcast and where it's going. Um, you're either watching it on YouTube or you're listening to it on Apple podcasts or Spotify or any one of those many, uh, podcasting tools. We've been kind of hammering on the YouTube stuff because there's more interaction and there's more ability for people to participate. And in the last few weeks, we added the ability to not just like and subscribe, which you should do anyway, but also to be a member. And there are a couple different tiers. There's economy class, business class, and first class, and they get you different things. And I just want to briefly talk about some of the things you get and why it's helpful to us. It's helpful to us because it helps monetize our effort, and this is not an inexpensive uh, endeavor when you consider all the time and energy and, and equipment we're putting into it. But you also get things like a priority reply. You get uh, custom badges and emoji. Uh, you have the ability to pers participate in our live chats. But the thing that I like the best about it is the early access that uh, members get. So, you know, today is Saturday and we're going to publish this episode on Thursday. But in a perfect world, that means we're finishing it a little bit early, sometimes a day or two early. And for people who are members, uh, they get that kind of access. So it's finished. It's just not published. And then they get to see it. You get to see it. it and out. you also just really, basically, you're supporting us. And listen, what we, what we do with this revenue, Andy makes yeah, it we sound put, like we put it right back in. into a conglomerate. But <laughs> no. we've been taking the money that we've been getting. And we've used hey, money, but don't, we don't, really don't share that uh, information. It's encouraging Jeff. us to emotionally, emotional support. But also we've been using it to um, like up the algorithm. Yeah, we're like pumping to, it right back in there. So it's growing. So we get ad buys. And so we, it, we get to expose it to people. And so people get to see the program who otherwise wouldn't. Right. And, and, and ultimately, I think viewers understand that what we're trying to do is, is to help the public understand what happened to this plane because the mystery is yeah. important. It, it matters what happened to this plane. And I think it's, we're, we're trying to make the world a better place by helping people understand this very important tragedy that happened to 239 people, but is also affecting the whole world. Yeah, so that's a really good segue because what we're going to talk about today is how part of figuring out this mystery 
is finding explanations for things that are previously don't have explanations or inexplicable and putting them together and not just looking at individual parts of it and saying, well, that's weird, but seeing how it ties into the, the big picture. Right. So, you know, we brought in our expert for uh, the, the marine life stuff. And we talked to one of the world's leading oceanographers about, yeah, Jim Carlton was great. Yeah, He was outstanding. Right. And he really, speaking of deep dives, I mean, this guy told, told us more about lepus than certainly I've ever heard. They don't really um, dive deep. They actually float on the surface, but whatever. It's a figurative deep metaphor. dive. It's a very figurative I appreciate the deep dive. Thank you. Metaphor. I'm doing the best I can. But today we're going to come back to something that we talked about in episode 10, which is one of the most fascinating and controversial episodes. That one was called Backdoor. Mm-hmm. And that's where we talked about the hypothetical situation in which hackers could f- fake the data, basically, mm-hmm. to make it look like the plane went south when it really went north. Right. That's that's one of those things that like, man, people people are like, OK, I just can't can't accept. Well, that. I mean, I would even go further than that, Andy. I would say that most people who know who have even heard about this case or most people who even have delved into it pretty deeply. Most people don't know why the authorities thought that the plane went south. They Everyone knows that the authorities said that they're very confident the plane went south, but yeah. they don't actually know why the authorities thought that. And it all goes down to this thing that we spent episode 10 talking about, which has to do with withdrawing inferences from very, very tiny changes in frequency that were gener- that was generated by uh, this box on the back of the plane called the SDU. Yeah. And I developed an idea with the help of Victor Ianello, um, who did most of the heavy lifting, actually. But together, Victor and I were, you know, were teasing out this, the possibility that is there a vulnerability, actually a very unusual vulnerability that very few planes would have, but that this plane had that would allow a very motivated and sophisticated and well-resourced attacker on board the plane to alter these signals to make it seem on later mathematical analysis like the plane went south when it actually had gone north. And this would explain why the debris was never found on the on the seabed. It would also explain some other really weird things like how come this the satellite data unit came to be rebooted in the first place. So it would really mm-hmm. help resolve a lot of otherwise imponderable mysteries the question is like, okay, that's to get back to what you're saying about the marine life. Is this just your opinion or does somebody who actually knows what they're talking about think that that's plausible? So we are returning to the episode 10 topic of the potential for hacking and general bad stuff that would have allowed this plane to be hijacked by someone other than the pilot. And for that, you spoke to Ken Monroe. This guy is fascinating. He is, yeah. uh, he's a founder of Pentest Partners in the UK. And I just, I mean, tell me about this guy a little bit and then we'll jump into the interview. Yeah, I mean, I reached out to him because partly as a result of MA370, I've been very fascinated by the ongoing um, effects of things like GPS hacking on yeah. commercial aviation, um, the possibility that, you know, could autopilots be remotely hacked? There have been various news accounts over the years. Um, and in the, just in the last few months, um, actually really at the end of 2023, um, there had been a dramatic increase in, um, GPS spoofing of airplanes in such a way that these planes would be flying along and they would start to drift off course because the GPS, um, was being spoofed. And this of course was very interesting to me as someone who'd spent a lot of time thinking about meddling with with the airplanes and spoofing. Um, so I reached out to a number of of cybersecurity experts who focus on aviation, one of the first being Ken Monroe. Ken, Ken uh, is a, the founder of this company called Pen Test Partners. That's short for penetration test, meaning they they're basically white hat hackers. They try to think yeah. about how would a bad guy get into a system to um, take advantage of it. Yeah, ethical he, hackers are the coolest. I like these guys because they go and they report back to the companies that have been hacked and tell them what was wrong, but they don't go out there and just tell everybody. They give them a chance to fix it. Exactly. I'm fascinated by people like this because they have to think like a bad guy, but be a good guy. And he, one of the things that he – and he, he says that one of the problems of trying to find vulnerabilities in airplanes is that, you know, unlike an iPhone or a, you know, modem or something, which you can just go buy at Best Buy – 
you can't just buy a plane. So, but he would, what he managed to do is during COVID when a lot of planes weren't flying, he went to a company that had one, a, a 747 in this case, and he said, can I, if I pay for the um, aviation fuel to run the generator, can I play with your system? And they were like, sure. So he went in and he found some interesting vulnerabilities. He'll talk about that in the interview. Um, but, you know, it's one thing to come up with um, what looks to your eye as a layman as a potential vulnerability. It's another thing to take it to a professional and say, hey, guy who looks for vulnerabilities, is this a vulnerability? Is this a way that this plane could have been spoofed? And I, Ken very generously agreed to look. I wrote up a pricey. I wrote up a description of how this whole process would work. Um, and he looked at it and, well, you'll see what he thought. I yeah, basically let's, let's agreed jump to sit into, down and talk with me. Let's jump into the first segment of your interview with him. Ken, you are one of the foremost experts in, I would say, aviation cybersecurity. Would you say that? Yeah, we've certainly got a very strong interest in aviation cyber. So my background, my team's background, we're, we're penetration testers, so ethical right. hackers. Okay. Um, and one of the things that the kind of COVID changed, a lot of airplanes got retired early. And that right. meant that the breakers yards got backed up. So we got to go and do some brand new vanilla research, learning how to hack airplanes. Yeah. So I had talked to you uh, for an article for New York Magazine about kind of the kind of the vulnerabilities that exist in cybersecurity. People are f probably have heard about various state actors, Chinese, uh, Russia, even the United States, are sort of probing the weaknesses of their potential adversaries' infrastructure. We tend to think of hacking as classically like breaking into the server and stealing the secret plans or just like hacking people's bank accounts and stealing their money. But there's like lots of different ways you can exploit weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to think of, of hacking groups as, as organized now. Mm -hmm. I, I know of hacking groups which have got an HR function in them. Right. We have to think about money. You know, it, right. it's, it's how, what is the quickest route for a, attacker group X to make money? And that might be ransomware, right. holding an organization ransom, or it might be just doing something more insidious. But I mean, we in the case here in the United States in the, in the run up to the 2016 election, we had this Russian uh, military intelligence link group breaking into the DNC, the D Democratic National Committee and, and stealing emails and releasing them and causing all kinds of chaos. So you can you can have various motives. Yeah, hell yeah. I mean, it's, again, follow the money, follow the nation states. You know, right. There's always someone with an interest in causing chaos somewhere, whether it's trying to influence the outcome of election, right. or maybe it's trying to destabilize civil society by, for example, causing power cuts, which we saw happen in the Ukraine as the um, mm. hostilities with Russia started kicking off. Right, right, right. And so your specialty, your focus is aviation. So you do something called penetration testing, right? Your company is called Pentest uh, Partners, which means yep. penetration test, meaning you're t sort of imagining yourself as a black hat. You're trying to think, well, if I was the bad guy, what would I do? So you found yourself with this plane. You, you, you were telling me before about how you, uh, because of COVID, there were some planes that weren't being used. You were able to get access to one and you were able to kind of play with it. And what, yeah. and what did you find? So that, that's the crazy thing is you know, most times, you know, our, our history was industrial controllers, IoT, which you can go and buy off eBay and Amazon. So you can easily get hold of the hardware components to play with. Unfortunately, you can't do that with an airplane, right? Mm. You know, those 747s are a bit expensive to buy on eBay, right? right? So COVID changed things. The breakers yards, they got backed up and we picked up the phone and said, look, hey, uh, you know, that airplane that landed two days ago, is it going anywhere again? I said, no. Right. So if we pay you for the jet fuel for the APU, can we power it up and come and investigate? And we found all sorts of really interesting things. First and most importantly is, as we suspected, you can't just hack an airplane from a seating coach, right? It doesn't okay. work like that. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully that will reassure uh, you know, the traveling public that you, know, you okay. can't just sit there and laptop and <laughs> take control. No, it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, okay. What we did start discovering were as the plane becomes more connected, some of the data feeds, some of the systems that pilots use, that's where there was opportunity to start tampering with data. And a good example of that that we, we talked about briefly was the idea of an electronic flight bag. Mm. So an EFB, uh, it's a tablet. It's, yep. it's, a, it's a Windows tablet, an Android tablet, and a, a, an iPad, which runs a suite of apps that help the pilots um, navigate. Okay. It helps them land. 
it helps them understand how much power to use on takeoff and it helps them understand the weight of the balance of the airplane and lots of other things it does it really efficiently but we found some bugs in some of the apps that those um efbs use that could in certain edge cases be used to spit the wrong information out to the pilot right but of course you know we're ethical, you know, we're, we're the responsible people with the white hats, if you like. So if right. we find things, we talk to the manufacturers first, talk to the airlines right. first and say, hey, we found something interesting. What do you think? Right. And there's a great case in point with a, a vulnerability we found in a Boeing uh, electronic flight bag tool called OPT. And we mm -hmm. told Boeing about it. And they were like, hey, thanks. Um, right. Hey, come and talk to us about it. And over a period of about 18 months, that got fixed. And they were super responsible. And yeah. You know, hats off to Boeing. They, they did a really good job of dealing with that bug. Well, that's a nice thing to hear about a company yeah. that has not had a lot of things nice said about it. <laughs> but it seems to me that in cybersecurity in general, you, you kind of have to, if you are, or just probably security in general, if you want to be safe, you have to have some imagination and you have to say, um, you know, what, okay, let, let's think about the broadest possible range of things that could happen. And and then, you know, don't just say, well, I assume my attacker isn't smart enough to take to take advantage of this thing. You yeah. you kind of have to be open to possibilities. And that's, that's a really good point. I mean, it's, it's back to Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? You eliminate the impossible and the the plausible, however improbable. I think that's right. the has has to be the truth. Right. Um, I guess one, one of my big concerns is, is about things is we, t we talk about the Swiss cheese in the in the aviation model. And I talk right. about that, that cyber the safety um i guess the nature of safety in aviation is is, right. is they're always looking for the holes right fixing them before they become problems we also talk right. about these cascades these chains of events and you often right. see something goes wrong something else goes wrong someone's right. tired but the plane doesn't crash because the cascade stops and when right. you look at a, a genuine safety case where you know something's gone wrong with an airplane maybe it's had a, a it's, it's struck its tail or gone off the runway or, or god forbid had a crash actually it's that line of swiss cheese holes in the swiss cheese it's really really interesting you know i talked about it a little bit before but i think it's worth emphasizing that i interviewed this guy for for new york magazine because i really believe that this is a topic that's just starting to be important but it's going to be massive in the years to come especially as aviation gets automated increasingly, you're going to see more, you're going to, there's going to be an attempt to move from two person cockpits to one person cockpits. You, you might even see unmanned flight. Um, and as things get more and more automated, there's going to be more and more opportunities for hacking and mayhem. And those trade-offs are going to become very important. And so guys like Ken, I feel like are really on the cutting edge. Yeah, we're going to hear more from him, but first we're going to do our interstitial, which is a fancy word for saying add. And this one, Jeff, this one was a live read. This is the first time we've done one of these. You ready? I think so. <laughs> it's, it's easy. All right. Okay. Episode 22 is brought to you by Finished MKE. And I spent some time talking to the owner of Finished MKE, Matt Larson, yesterday to get an even better idea of what he does because we, he was a sponsor of episode 20 as well. And you might think that Finished MKE is a house flipper, and that is really selling this guy short because what his organization does is they take homes that are crappy and they make them good, but they also walk a new buyer through the entire process because buying a house is kind of scary when you are buying your first house. I mean, do you remember when you bought your first house? Yeah, I'm sitting in it. Oh, you're <laughs> right in the same now. house. Did you know what you were doing? I mean, no, you... I had absolutely no idea. And we wound up buying a very charming house that has a lot of history, and you can feel that. But it's old. It's a 1905 house, and it's not built to modern code, and it's got a crazy basement with, like, rocks for so you So you, like, kind of discovered things after the fact, right? Oh, my God. Okay. Yes. Same, same thing here. When I bought my first house, I was, like, 30 years old, and it was cheap, and it was old. And I think it probably was a flip house, but... It wasn't done very well, and it just was one problem after another. And gradually, I learned as I got older. But what uh, Finished MKE does is they they will their their design sensibilities, their understanding of the process. They'll work with a new buyer to put them in a place that they can feel good about, and they can feel like they made the right choice. And what I noticed yesterday in talking to him is, even though he is in Milwaukee, as am I, 
uh, he is set up to work anywhere, both in the United States and internationally. So if that sounds like something that is of interest to you, and either in a selling or buying or investing capacity, uh, we're going to put up a link. He's finished M underscore MKE on, on all the socials. Um, he's, there's some amazing examples of his work. And most of all, we're just really appreciative that he's supporting our, our podcast and coming back as a two-time sponsor. So Definitely. Thanks, thanks, Matt. Thanks, finished MKE. That's pretty awesome. Buy this if, guy's house. Uh, yeah, you should. Um, he's worked on my own house and he's done a really good job. Uh, if you are interested in being a sponsor of Deep Dive MH370, you can check out our show page, which has links and information, or quite simply, you can email me at andy at onmilwaukee.com and we'll talk about it and we'll figure out how to make something really cool. So back to the show. Great. So after I interviewed Ken for New York Magazine, um, I, I said to him, I reached out to him and I said, listen, I've been working on this theory since 2014. Yeah. Um, I would love to get your professional opinion as to whether there's any validity to it or even possible validity to it. And he, he agreed to take a look. So I sent it to him and this is, this is what he had to say. Ken, let's get to the meat of the matter. So I, you've been very generous to, you agreed to look at this, that this idea that, that I had been working on with um, so the help of some other people, notably Victor Ianello. And this, this idea is to, is to sort of ask in the spirit of like, what is the outer envelope of things that we should be able to consider? Was MH370 potentially, uh, did it possess potentially a security vulnerability? Now, I really want to emphasize, this is not to say that it was taken advantage of, but I think that the, for the exercise of today is to say, is it conceivable that this vulnerability existed? Because we're, we're starting to get into an era where, where, as you say, things are more integrated and we should be more and more aware of cybersecurity vulnerabilities. So I sent you this document that basically yeah. writes, that wrote up this like long kind of fairly complicated idea yeah. and you were generous enough to look at it. And I, so what, what, what were your sort of overall thoughts? So I thought it was a really well-written document. I'll be honest with you. So one of my colleagues who has, uh, is very skilled in aviation um, and aeronautics, he looks at it and said, it, it, it's a plausible document. You know, mm. Technically, it stacks up. Okay. Um, the the discussion point that was made, I, I think we'd say it's plausible. Okay. Is it probable? And that's yeah. that's the bit where I where I'm struggling actually. It's okay. Not only that bit, but also the other bits of the Swiss cheese that had to line up as well to make that theory plausible. Okay. Okay. But to talk about, um, let's maybe we could start just by talking about yeah. sort of the gist of what we're what we're getting at here and why it might be possible to carry out. And then I also definitely want to talk about why you think it was not carried out. But so maybe I could start just by sort of recapping a bit. The idea is that the, the location of the plane as determined by the Australian investigators was based on subtle changes in frequency that were generated <laughs> it, uh, if, if you're interested in this, you're going to have to like read a whole yeah. other thing because it's quite long, but it has to do with changes in the frequency that were generated by an algorithm within, the, within this particular piece of equipment called the satellite data unit, which is physically located above the economy class cabin in a triple seven. And you can access it by opening it up, opening up the ceiling panel and the box is there. There's a plug in the front um, called the PDL. And you can plug a box into it that maintenance crews use to update the software. Yep. And and if you were to change a parameter in the, it's called the systems table. And this is one of the, basically the variables that the algorithm uses to calculate this, the frequency at which it broadcasts. And so the sort of the nut of the question that I was asking you, Ken, is, is it possible that somebody on board the plane in flight could get in there, plug into this box and change that parameter so that they could alter the transmission frequency, potentially thereby altering the data that the investigators would ultimately get and, and, and use to calculate the search area. Super complicated, pretty <laughs> arcane, but the question is like, okay, should, we can, should, should this be included in the list of things that are within the outermost perimeter of what's yeah. conceivable? Yeah, so I, I spent quite a bit of time um, uh, looking at some of the findings in the documentary that you're involved in, which you know, was fascinating. Um, there were bits of me that I, I got quite frustrated, but I thought it was absolutely fascinating to go into mm -hmm. some more detail of 
why we felt some of those things couldn't work. Now, okay. first of all, the SDU, this, the uh, the SATCOM um, terminal, um, it, it's in the overhead in the right. passenger cabin in a triple seven, I believe. It's quite unusual because um, most of the uh, the devices, the avionics, if you will, are actually in the avionics bay. Mm -hmm. Remarkably, the the SATCOM terminal in an older seven forty seven is in the same sort of place. It's 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 right up. Um, you're going to need a big ladder to get up there, though. Uh, you're going to have to under get... the antenna is the reason it's there yeah so you've got to um <laughs> first first of all, you've got a physical access problem so okay. you're going to need a step ladder okay so you're going to have to unmount the ceiling panels which are actually quite easy to do um, okay. i don't recommend anyone tries it in the air but they're Please actually quite easy this. to unmount <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, the will not be happy <laughs> yeah and i've got photographs of us on a 747 at the top of a step ladder actually looking at the sdu oh wow um, and we were up at the top of a what <sighs> It must have been a, a 12 foot step ladder. So you've got a physical access problem to start with. It's, it's okay. not easy to get up there, right? Okay. But yeah, you know, the, it's, there are interfaces up there. Now I've actually brought along a, um, an example. So this is um, what's called a line replaceable unit. So this okay. is not an SDU, this is actually a radio altimeter or a radalt. Now these things sit in great racks in the avionics bay and the SDU okay. doesn't look that dissimilar to this. They often look a bit more like they're on the side, but um, okay. as you can see, there's lots and lots of um, interfaces here so in the okay. case of a rad out that'll go to a receiver an antenna and then lots of other interfaces with the airports the aircraft systems now the sdu wait wait before just to spe just to clarify so it's called a line replaceable unit because yes. kind of as the name implies you can pull it out and replace the whole thing you don't have yep. to take the entire airplane apart and it and sits in it helps dispatch. So these sit in great big yeah. uh, racks in the avionics bay, the EE bay. Right. If you go onto um, you know, any search engine, you'll look for a, a, a picture of an electronics bay, you'll see racks of these. And the reason okay. they're called line replaceable is if there's a fault or something's not behaving fun easily, it's very, very easy for the maintenance engineer to just pull this one out, put another one in, right. send this off to the shop, and then Boom. the airplane's going again. So okay. line replaceable, it means we our planes go more frequently without getting faults. Got it. And it's located... This particular kind is unlike the SDU, is located mm -hmm. in the electronics bay, which in a triple seven is towards the front of the plane. Yep. There's a hatch at the front of the first class cabin near the near the galley. Yeah, that's right. It's quite unusual the triple seven. Uh, it's like the seven forty seven. So um, almost all uh, uh, avionics bay access. So in the small in the short haul planes, it's going to be external. There's no internal mm -hmm. door. Uh, modern uh, long haul airliners, the avionics bay hatch is typically inside the cockpit. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the 777 and the 747, the, there is a door uh, in the forward area that will take you down to the main avionics bay. And mm -hmm. in the 747, um, if you remember the movie with Steven Seagal, it's called Executive Decision. Nice. You fly a stealth flighter up underneath and put a crazy tunnel up. Right. Genuinely, you could kind of do that in a 747 if you stretch reality a bit. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Where is Steven Seagal right now? I want to know. <laughs> it's a great this question. It's dangerous. Okay. Okay. So that's a, so, so that's a line replaceable unit. Um, it, but, but of course, what we're talking about is not there. I think you were starting mm -hmm. to say. I cut you yeah, off. So and I just typically what you. we're looking for. So the, the satellite data unit, again, um, I know more about them on the 747 than I do on the 777. Um, okay. There are interfaces, and I've got some other LIUs around which do have interfaces on. This, for example, has a, uh, a troubleshooting port. It's actually you know, what looks like an old RS-232 port, but anyway. Okay. Here's the thing, though. So PDL, uh, that stands for the Portable Data Loader. So okay. that's the, the way that um, maintenance engineers update the software on these LRUs. So sometimes it's a direct connection, but most times it's going to be an interface in the avionics bay where they can connect a ruggedized laptop, probably in a Peli case, mm. plug it in with weight on wheels. They can mm. then apply software updates or software fixes to the line replaceable units. Uh, so they get their latest updates and everything's nice and good and secure and, and fine. Okay. Uh, Ken brings up a topic in in that last interview where he's talking about weight on wheels i know what that is um that basically means that stuff only happens when the plane is in its parked or on on ground configuration right yeah there's there's things that um the plane really should not do unless there's weight on the wheels of the plane a really obvious one is is like a thrust reverser this is where the engines instead of pushing the air back they put the, push the air forward and it slows you down really, really fast. If you do that in air, you're screwed. Okay, so you can only do thrust reverse, thrust reversal if there's weight on wheels. Um, 
But another thing you can't do, as Ken talks about, is you can't update a lot of these systems. You can't reprogram the computers in mid-flight. You have to be on the ground, you know, in between loading up passengers and everything like this. The, the, the system is designed so you can't screw around with it in flight. The point is just being like, if you're trying to do something that the plane will only let you do with weight on wheels, it makes it a lot more complicated, not necessarily impossible, but a lot more complicated if you have to have weight on wheels. It should be impossible to push a software update to an LRU without weight on wheels. By that, I mean the airplane's on the ground, mm -hmm. it's not flying, therefore it's much safer to mm -hmm. apply software updates. Now, without weight on wheels, you should not be able to push a new software update to the LRU. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of, the, one of the issues I had with um, the Netflix piece is that um, one shouldn't be able to simply push new software, but we gave it a bit more thought. And of course, actually there are chipsets inside here and mm. arguably you could unmount those chips. You could clip programmers onto them. And in mm. theory, you know, it's stretching the bounds of reality a bit after dismantling this, you could in theory reprogram parts of it that mm. might meet the, um, the criteria uh, to cause that misreporting of the satellite position. Okay. Wow. But so, but that's really, really involved, right? Yeah. So you've got to yeah. get get there, get it down, get it into pieces, know it right. inside out, be able to connect right. to it, be able to provide the required credentials that it might need to reprogram it to tell it to do something different. That's a big job. That's a very okay. high skill exercise. Okay. But so even to, so, even um, if you have physical access to the box, you've got your step ladder, you've taken out the panel, you've plugged in your PDL, you can't do a um a software update without weight on wheels even you shouldn't the... be able to okay. okay um what can you spoof a weight on wheel signal it, potentially it okay. might be possible and again it's an electrical signal um, yeah. just come from transducers on the on the undercarriage but okay. again it's another layer of complexity it's another hole in the many layers of swiss cheeses to cheese to make the stack right okay so, I mean, the thing is, we're so, even asking the question, we're so far out in the fringes of like what is, you know, conceivable to most people. And frankly, I did ask, I have asked the scientists at Inmarsat who, who did the analysis of these signals that allowed them to determine where the plane went. I asked them if they had considered the possibility that these signals had been tampered with. And I will come back to the same comment we made previously. And if, even with hindsight now, you can see that whoever did that would have to have six months' worth of knowledge of what would happen. They have to have to know what how data would be used, things that involved, everything like that. And, and there's nothing to show that evidence at all, as far as I'm aware. Again, when we're talking about the fringes of what is possible and what is not possible, if we begin the exercise by saying, okay, let's let our imaginations run wild mm -hmm. and imagine a like almost infinitely sophisticated and clever and ruthless whatever opponent. You, you have to you have to you have to imagine like as I said almost unthinkable motivation and resources etc um, but so you ha you're, you're saying that you 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 don't really know but it seems unlikely that you could do it through the PDL you probably would have to take the box apart but I think you know getting back to this idea we mooted before Ken which is that if you have physical access to a to an electronic component, and as I say, like unlimited cleverness and resources, you can make it do anything it's capable of doing. Arguably. I mean, what, okay. what we should be doing, well, there's many things you take from um, you know, doing IoT devices, doing hardware, is mm -hmm. it shouldn't be possible to um, cause the device to do other things. We shouldn't be able to push new firmware to it okay. to cause it to do something else because it should be cryptographically protected. So without mm. providing a, a cryptographic password or checksum, um, it shouldn't be possible to be able to unlock the chips in order to get them to do something else. Right. Again, you know, that's that's kind of you know, right up to date. And the sort of LRUs that you'll find in a 20-year-old airplane, you know, they don't reflect state-of-the-art hardware security. Yeah, you know, we're going back in time here, um, and even the most modern LRUs on an airplane—they were probably designed five years ago. Even on planes that are, you know, coming off the line, brand new right now. Well, the MCS six thousand, which is the particular model of SDU that was involved yeah. here, was itself already obsolete by the time 
that yeah. this pl flight took took place and so it's even hard to find proper documentation about it yeah. so that's interesting but it, ken i did want to ask you about some of the, you talked about the swiss cheese of improbability like what are so we already talked about the ladder we already talked about the necessity of like actually taking walk probably taking the box apart were there other things that you just felt like that sort of would you would include in the set of, of things that would count as swiss cheese yeah so one of the other big areas of the swiss cheese that really really bothers me is mm -hmm. um I kind of think it was the wrong plane. <laughs> oh, <laughs> this, really? might, this might seem a really odd piece, but the yeah. the triple seven is quite an unusual airplane. Mm. So back in the day, so the the, the seven thirty seven, the A three twenty, they all use an older um, network protocol called ARINC forty nine, which has been mm. around since you know the dawn of time. Uh, but the triple seven was different. One of the problems with ARINC forty nine is it's it's not really a network as such. It's a series of point to point cable connections, right. which is great, um, but it means you need a lot of wiring. Mm. So the triple seven um, came out with a new set of a new protocol called ARINC 69, which is actually an inductively coupled network. And the mm. result, it means you, you ran a, a series of bus cables around and you clamp onto them inductively. And this is actually a genuine inductive coupler from a, a triple seven. And so rather than have cables going everywhere, you had a network which inductively coupled through here. Okay. And it meant that you could you could save you know, miles of cables, so therefore much more weight. Your plane was more uh, efficient, less carbon dioxide. So that was really cool. But ARINC 69 is much much more challenging to decode and inject as a protocol. So ARINC 49, mm. relatively straightforward. So even a, a simple tool like a, a picoscope, which is like a, a $500 piece of kit, can okay. decode, and it's not too much harder to then inject, although there are timing issues. 69 different matter you need much more expensive custom hardware like just okay. the decoders thirty thousand dollars wow so it means you've got an, yet another layer of complexity here that's required so not so first of all you've got to get the sdu you've got to take take it apart you've got to reprogram it which is a challenge believe me and okay. then you've got another one if you want to you know as was mooted control the airplane from the avionics bay using a laptop right. you've then got to now reinterface with a whole different network that isn't as well known and is much harder to connect to so so andy what i had reached out to ken to talk about was the question of could this bfo data be hacked could it be spoofed of course um i i hadn't really intended to talk to him about another issue which had always seemed to me kind of a downstream issue like first mm -hmm. of all can you hack the data to make it look like the plane went south when it really went north. But secondarily, there would arise this issue. OK, if you did that, how would you then also take the plane somewhere else? Um, and there's a real problem in the idea of like breaking into the cockpit in time for that turn at Agari without the pilots, you know, radioing for help or, or anything like that. And so the idea that I um, described in my book, The Taking of MH370, was this idea that you, since the 777 was Boeing's first all-electric plane, it was the first plane that Boeing made that all the flight services were controlled by um, these computers in the electronics bay. So if yeah. you got into the electronics bay, would it be possible to um, basically hijack the flight control services of this plane? And I hadn't really intended to talk to Ken about it, um, oh, parenthetically, so in the Netflix documentary, Mike Exner says, in no uncertain terms, you cannot do this. Yeah, he definitely poo-poo's it, but he, he doesn't say it. why. He's quite, mean. He's quite mean to me about <laughs> it. Also, in the famous Atlantic article that William Langovich did, he, also, he actually says something like, there's so many reasons why you can't do this that I, can't, I won't even go into them. I, right? I love that. I love that so line. So this is like, an idea that's been kind of poo but it. to my surprise... Yeah. Ken actually, well, you'll listen to what Ken says about this. If you can get onto this bus, this data bus, and you can figure out how to, to talk to it and give it instructions to it, because theoretically you can talk to any, any of the devices that's on the box, any device that is on the data bus, you can interface with. With sufficient skill and research okay. and funding, maybe. Right, right. Okay. That's a big one. That's a big hurdle. Yeah. And I think that's that's what what concerned me is is each layer of the Swiss cheese in this in this theory, right, was a big hurdle by itself. Right. It, it's right. not it's not the pilot being a bit tired. It's not the pilot 
you know, miscommunicating with his co-pilot. It's yeah. not some bad weather, uh, all contributing to a series of events that cause an airplane to, I don't know, land heavily. It's it's a series of very significant technical hurdles, each yeah. one of which is big by itself. Got it, got it, got it. I mean, I guess my response would be to say that we don't know where this plane is. And mm -hmm. the scientists who to find the search area, it created a probability distribution and it looked a little bit like a fried egg. And the further away you, you get from the yolk, kind of less and less likely okay. it is to find it. And they wound up searching a really huge area and the plane wasn't there. And so there's kind of the interesting question of like, well, how do we possibly explain this? And so I yep. guess the exercise of me talking to you today is to address the possibility that the reason it wasn't found where the data defined the area is because the data had been tampered with. Now, obviously that is going out on a limb and we're trying to gauge today how unlikely it is. And you're telling me it's like very, somewhere in the area between impossible and just very unlikely, right? But not quite as, yeah. as impossible. And I, I think I was telling you in an email that the entire case at this point lives in this gray space between unlikely and impossible because they should have found the plane by now. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, for the victims, for their families, yeah. for the industry as a whole to be able to you know, close and learn from this, I think it would be incredibly powerful. You know, it's, it's an unsolved mystery right now and we need right. to find a way of solving it so we can all be even safer as a traveling public. Um, the challenge I have is, is it plausible? Yes. Right. Yeah. Is, it, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? Well, as one of my colleagues suggested, you know, a ton of gold might land on my driveway tomorrow, which I'd be very <laughs> happy about, but it's pretty implausible. Um, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I would, and it's like yeah. such a perfect, like poetic way to sum it up. It's possible. Okay. And okay. that's my big, my big challenge is with sufficient resource with sufficient yeah. skill, with sufficient incredible knowledge of the 777, its suppliers and its systems. Yeah, it's possible, but I don't think it's plausible, sadly. So there you have it. Um, this is a guy who really knows his stuff about um, cybersecurity and, and hacking. And he's, he thinks that this idea is, is plausible, it's possible. He doesn't think it happened, he thinks it's just re would require so much work, so much sophistication yeah. um, that he does not think it probably happened. But, you know, as I said to him, and I've said many times before, there are no good simple answers to what happened to this plane. The entire case of MH370 resides in this gray area between implausible and impossible. So yeah, and I, I, was very, thing... I was very encouraged to hear him say this. Yeah. Just... And, and again, he's speaking on his topic, just like Jim, our marine biologist, is speaking on his topic. And when you look right. at these things in an isolated sort of way, imp implausible is 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 generous for, for right. how weird this is. But if you look at the totality of it, then all these extremely implausible things kind of roll up into something that perhaps is a little bit more likely. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like the implausibilities kind of line up, right? Yeah. So if you're looking at these at the marine life, and you had, and, and all you know about the Inmarsat data is that it conclusively tells you that the plane went south. Yeah. And you know, and every re reasonable person is telling you the plane had to go south. Then you look at this marine life and you're like, well, I can't explain it, but it must make sense somehow. And conversely, um, when, if you're looking at this Inmarsat data, and all you know is that there's this debris has washed up and every reasonable person says it has to have come from the plane then you think, well, there's this in Marset data, it's weird that, that, that this vulnerability exists, which is so few planes have this vulnerability. Um, but when you, when you, so when you, when you, it's only when you take these two pieces of information together that it all starts to add up. So we're 22 episodes into this series and we're almost done with this specific episode. So I think it's time for me to tell you what I think happened to this plane. Okay. And I don't know if you're ready to talk about that yet, but maybe I, I'm, listen, what you think about what probably happened is great. I mean, it's all about evolving senses of probability. I mean, we're not going to stop until we've like turned over every stone. But as you're turning over stones, your sense of like what most likely happened is going to change. And I don't care what you think so long as you don't cling to it 
too I'm not tight clinging to it. I'm not yeah, clinging yeah, yeah. to it, and I could be very wrong. But here's okay. my here's my theory after everything we've learned, especially including today. All right, this okay. plane, I believe this plane was taken by hijackers. I believe this plane was taken by Russian hijackers because they are the only country that has a sophistication to pull off something as grandiose and sophisticated as what we're proposing. Um, I think that they did anticipate the BFO data being uh, something that, that Inmarsat would look at. And if they would have been wrong and they wouldn't have looked at it, they just would have covered, they would have done a better job of covering their tracks that they needed than they needed to. Because everyone said, well, Inmarsat hadn't even invented the concept of looking at BFO data. Well, the former KGBs, they're pretty smart and they're very good hackers. I don't think that the plane was flown from the electronics bay, at least not for very long. I believe that when the Russian hijackers went down there, they did that primarily to turn off the oxygen supply and using their scuba diving knowledge and with the portable air oxygen canisters had enough oxygen to disengage the SDU and also to maybe institute one severe turn. But at that point, when they turned off that fuse bus that also controlled the, cat, um, the cockpit door, that should have been unlocked. And at that point, their magical device could have been plugged in from the cockpit as, as our expert says, how there are these actual inputs on these planes. And this was a much less sophisticated time. I mean, this were some pretty antiquated uh, by today's standards. Um, uh, systems that uh, had not yet been exploited, and we just showed how they can actually be done. Yeah, that's and... a really that's a really excellent point, Andy. You know, we should we should draw a line under that thing that Ken said, which is that like this plane was built in the '90s. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, the plane was in 2014, but it's the the, the equipment is is older, much older than that. So yeah, that's a really great point. I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just no. Nope, that's about. I mean, I, I pretty much think that everything else we've talked about uh, checks out, and we're going to get into more detail about that of sub in subsequent episodes. But I think the the kicker here is that this plane was hijackable and was hackable by people who had enough resources, enough motivation, and enough knowledge and money to pull it off. And from everything I've seen over 22 episodes, that is the most logical explanation I can come up with. I appreciate that. I think that's a very lucid, lucid take. You know, I think we've really made news here today, Andy. I think what we've brought to our listeners is something that I think would blow a lot of people's minds, which is that not only has some random journalist proposed an idea that this, that this BFO could be spoofed, yeah. but, it, but an actual cybersecurity professional is saying, yes, this vulnerability did exist. Um, he, he doesn't think it happened, but if you're going to, I think we, it needs to be included in the menu of possibilities. And if the Australian authorities would acknowledge that even if they didn't think it happened, it is a possibility that needs to be considered, that would be epical. I hope it happens. And the it's only a, way it's going to happen is we're going to continue to plug away at this and you viewers and you listeners are helping us by your support. So yeah. that is again, why well, you should be liking and subscribing yeah. Yeah. and keep this thing rolling. We're quickly approaching the 10th anniversary of yeah. the disappearance of MH370. And we are, you know, this has really lit a fire under me to sharpen my investigative tools. And I'm finding some really cool stuff where you're going to, I'm not just whistling Dixie. I think today's episode was a huge one yeah. and there's going to be more like this. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to learn things about this plane that a lot of people are going to be surprised about. I love it. So Episode 22 was brought to you by Finished MKE. Our title music, which is awesome, was composed by a previous sponsor and fan, Jacob John. And we'll be back at you next week for the 23rd episode as we approach the 10th anniversary of the taking of MH370. Jeff, it's been a wild ride, and I'm looking forward to continuing it with you. For a Hold long on your time. hats. Bye, guys. Bye.